the legacy of Susie Cooper. When I started to look into this, I kept coming across the legacy of Susie Cooper, and so I realised that I was on the right track, that you know, I wasn't the only person who thought that you know, Susie Cooper had left an awful lot behind her. And I don't mean just parts either. Um, you know, it's extraordinary that her inspiration, her achievements should still mean so much today. I almost went off onto a tirade about Clarice Cliff then, but I went. Um, just because we, we happened to be speaking about Clarice Cliff yesterday, but I do think there's such a difference between the two designers. Um, but anyway, this is Tunstall. Susie Cooper was born not far away from Tunstall at a place called Stanfields. Again, it's quite extraordinary that Clarice Cliff should have been born in Tunstall as well. And at the, this time, um, in the 1920s and 30s, you know, we do seem to have such a number of female artists who suddenly seem to be successful. And there are obviously reasons for that which I, I will come on to. Fortunately, during her lifetime, Susie Cooper was incredibly prolific. It seems to me that no sooner had an idea occurred to her than it was committed to paper or to an actual pot. And her thought processes are still visible in the many trial pieces which, uh, with her permission, remained in the Wedgwood Museum collection when she moved to the Isle of Man. There are many drawings, but there are also pots of all shapes and sizes, glazed and unglazed, to which she's actually fixed tracing paper patterns. And such as her eagerness to test the visual impact of her latest concept. In this unique and treasured collection, there are sheets of cover coat, which is a type of a solid glaze, if you like, that's like paper that would have been attached to a, a piece and then it adheres to the pot while it's being fired. You will see it, actually better than me explaining it, there are examples in the exhibition outside. She was often striving for a precise colour or a completely new surface covering and she might start off doing a hand-painted design which will then be translated into a lithograph and her lithographs are so fine that sometimes it's very difficult to tell the difference between a hand-painted piece and a lithographed piece. There are other objects that we have which are so frail that I'm afraid we're still trying to find a way of displaying them properly so that you can actually see them. In particular, I'm talking about the pounces. A pounce, for those of you who don't know, is a tracing of a drawing which has then been pricked around and then it's been placed onto an object or onto a you know, flat piece of paper to work on the design. And then it's had either chalk or lead put onto it so that when you lift off the pounce there's a faint outline there and that is something that she could use straight on the, on the pots that were her trials. These aspects of the Susie Cooper collection that we have here are quite unique and I think from, certainly from a curatorial point of view that um, they're just as important as the finest vase or charger in that they provide lasting proof of her technical know-how and her constant quest to expand the boundaries of the ceramic medium. I don't think that we have the same um, extent of this, being able to see an artist at, at work with any other Wedgwood designer. I'm willing to be contradicted, but I do think that with Susie Cooper, you know, we do have that particular characteristic in the reserve collection. This aspect of the Susie Cooper collection, I think, is part of the artist's legacy. While the museum's representation of Susie Cooper's many styles in its entirety could not be described as comprehensive, I hope it will be one day, um, examples illustrating their development constitute a vital and quite rare insight into the way this particular artist worked. There was no greater eye-opener to me, and I know to others um, here today as well than um, being in Susie's studio at William Adams in Tunstall and seeing the way that Susie worked or going in when she was actually working on something and she may just have found some clay that she thought would make a nice relief on a vase or something and she'd been working away at it all. When I was helping her to clear away 
what was in her studio, I came across a rather large and garish design of parrots on a big piece of paper. And, you know, I said to her, would you like to keep this? What is it? She said, oh, it's just a design I was working on for some wallpaper. You know, how many people know that Susie Cooper was working on designs for wallpaper? And we also have the, um, the flat prototypes for the cutlery that she was making. Again, this is in the, um, the case outside. So there are very many facets as well. The other thing that I'll just bring to people's attention as well, and I really wish that we had it here, but we don't, is a book of Susie Cooper's miniatures. And when you open it up, it, it's not vases or cups and saucers and so forth. It's actually children's clothes. And just before the outbreak of the Second World War, Susie was going to go into business with one of her sisters making children's clothes. And the designs inside are all hers and they have sort of a collage effect of having the material that was going to be used for these designs um, actually stuck onto the drawings that Susie has done. And in itself, it's, it's a work of art. Sadly, because of the outbreak of war and rationing on material and so forth, it didn't go into production. But in fact, there is a, ba a brass plaque in the um, Susie Cooper collection on the Isle of Man, which says Susie Cooper miniatures on it. So that's how far they had got, you know, they'd even got the plaque for outside the, the door of the uh, place where these things were going to be made. Just to try and show you something of the variety that Susie was capable of. When I was thinking about Susie Cooper's legacy, I was thinking of words like tenacity and various nouns like that that seem to suit Susie. So they're not all artistic phrases or ceramic phrases. As I say, she was born near Tonstall, at a place called Stanfields. And as I said in my lecture on Clarice Cliff yesterday, I know this sounds obvious, but when and where she was born had a great bearing on her destiny. Well, it sounds fairly obvious, but it was just such an odd time in history, really. And being born in the Potteries as well, I suppose. You know, the Potteries is a rather unusual place as well. And that, again, would sway her artistic abilities in a certain way. She was one of seven children. She came from a background which was quite prosperous. They had a small holding with other businesses which would be attached to that small holding. And all the family worked together and they worked very hard. And I think this is probably where Susie learned her work ethic. And that was something that remained with her throughout her life even when she was retiring to the Isle of Man. She was talking about what she was going to be doing there, which was restoring two Georgian terraced houses in Douglas. She was really a bit impatient with all the structural things that had to be done because she wanted to get to the design element, and I think that was fairly typical. But to think of a, a woman of that age who was still thinking about things that she was going to be doing like that, and um, she was a hard worker her employees would tell you that you know she would go into the factory and if she thought it needed cleaning she would do it herself you know she would clean the floors to make sure that they were all done properly she was lucky i suppose in that um, her parents allowed her to express her artistic self she should have been going to to study to be a typist and in fact she ended up going to the Burzum school of art where she well, I suppose she proved herself to be an up-and-coming artist. But again, as I say, the fact that her parents would allow her to do this would be you know, something of um, an indulgence. So she was um, lucky to be in that sort of environment. But also, this was very much the heyday of the art schools in the potteries. And um, here you could see Burson Art School. She was also very fortunate that she had a, a tutor, Gordon Forsyth, who you can see here working on stained glass designs for St. Joseph's in Burslem. And um, this is something which was to, to stay with her and to stand her in such good stead, to have this friendship and tuition from Gordon Forsyth. I'm sorry for the, the um, rather poor slide of Grace here, but... Um, Susie Cooper did actually work for Grays with Gordon Forsyth. Again, she had a, a taste of industry and a way in which art could flourish in, in that sort of environment through him. Um, I mentioned to you about 
tenacity. With help from her Uncle Jack, Susie set up business in 1929 to begin with, which is very unfortunate considering that's when the Wall Street crash occurred and had such a, a terrible effect on the whole world, but also on the pottery industry. And um, so in a, in a way it was a false start because she did have to start again. We have images of Susie's work, obviously. And I showed this because it's obviously very geometric and I think perhaps people might look at it and think, oh, Clarice Cliff. But in fact, Susie Cooper could do the Art Deco and the jazz and the cubism, but she also moved on. And I think this might have worked against her in a way, in that when we look at Clarice Cliff, we say, oh, yes, she was a great exponent of Art Deco. When we look at Susie Cooper, yes, she was an exponent of Art Deco, but she was also an exponent of everything else that came after it. You know, up art and goodness knows what else as well. And uh, also a very capable floral artist as well. Not only the, um, the pots themselves have been left to remember Susie by, but the really important thing is, I think, the, the image that we have of her. You know, if I hadn't have met her with Gay, how many years ago it was, you know, I'd still be thinking she was a young girl. Because Susie Cooper, to me, conjures up a young girl. And I think this is something that uh, is obviously eternal, isn't it? You know, She was very clever because she used her own image to promote her style, elegance and utility. And you know, we often see the deer that she used as the backstamp or as a motif on her advertising material, as you can see here. But for a very beautiful young woman to use her image at this time it was very clever, actually. You know, this is in the 30s. She had a series of portraits done by a photographer called Cleo Cotterell. And if anybody knows anything about Cleo Cotterell, I'd really like to know because I just wonder if there are any other famous people that she, as she I mean, I assume it's a she, did um, portraits of. Here you can see Susie modelling Lummox, which is one of her favourite pieces. She's still in existence in her collection in the Isle of Man. She called it Lummox because it is such a clumsy figure, really. It really is very heavy, and her clothes are glazed, but her hands and her face are terracotta. She really does look like a, a Lummox. But this is very much Susie Cooper as the artist, you know, complete with artist smock. And again, we get the same sort of thing for, from her British Industries Fair stands. <clears throat> you get the impression of a person. You know, it's not just a factory turning out mass-produced pieces. You know, she could have just walked through here or, you know, just repositioned the pots or whatever. It's also very personal. Just to show you some of the pieces with her uh, deer and other animals on there, heraldic animals, she did try she used things like monkeys as well on her plates, but she said they just weren't elegant at all. And so she, um, she went back to doing the foxes and the deer and the rabbits and also the heraldic pieces. And again, I would urge you to have a look in the case outside, you know, where we do have some of the animal paintings, some of them hand-painted, like the ones on the, the wall there. This is a bit of an indulgence for me anyway, but I decided to represent the 1930s pieces, uh, designs that she did from the pattern books. And these are all kept in Susie Cooper's hand, these uh, particular ones, and they're works of art in their own right. And you can see the variety of styles that she has. This is a clown lamp base, she also produced nursery wear. And here again, you can see the geometric patterns, but also the floral designs as well. There's just so much effort in these designs. Um, the one at the bottom includes various techniques, including um, sgraffito in the glaze. And so you can get an idea of what sort of a, a draftswoman Susie Cooper was. And again, this is something that has been left for us to, to study and to be inspired by. One of the things that used to inspire me most of all about Susie Cooper was that she had so much common sense. I know that sounds a funny thing to say, but, and I don't like to sound sexist either, but you knew that she'd been a woman working in the kitchen by the things that she produced. 
The design on this, by the way, is crayon lines, and uh, which you can see. It's a muffin dish, and you can see the little plug there. It, it would have been designed sort of like a, a dish with a plate on the top, and then the plug would have been removed to fill the dish with hot water. And then you could put your muffins or whatever on the top, put the lid on, and keep them nice and, nice and warm. Now, as I say, this is a woman thinking about a, a design like this. This is a kestrel shape. But then even more so is this dish, which could, you could take the lid off the top and instead of it wobbling about all over the work surface, it would actually stand still by means of the handle. And you could also use it as a, an extra serving dish as well. And um, she was very much influenced herself by what she thought to be good design. And the best designs in her mind were the, um, the auger, uh, of which she had a, a beautiful new one in her kitchen, and Gordon Russell furniture, in particular the dining table. When she was working in the factory herself, she made sure that she had work for everybody, including a lady who could only do spots and nothing else. She had to make sure that she had work for the, the uh, lithographers and uh, the paintresses and so on. In uh, 1938, she married Cecil Barker, who was an architect, and in particular, he seems to have helped her with this, this design, which is called Classic Vista. And again, outside, we have a drawing, a small drawing, for this design. And it just shows how very accurate, it's not just sort of flourishing flowers or whatever. This is very meticulously drawn. It's a litho, by the way, if you're thinking it's a funny, an odd colour for a building. This is actually a litho which would have changed colour when it had been fired. Sadly, a lot of the entries in Susie Cooper's later pattern books are lithographs and they don't last very well and the pages stick together. And Because Susie was used to using these books in her studio as references, just reference books, you know. Whereas we've carefully kept them in a fireproof safe and goodness knows what, you know. They were actually her working tools. In 1943, I think it was, 1943, she had her son, Tim. Two years earlier, she had become the uh, first female potter to become a royal designer for industry. This design is called Hyde Park. It's one of the many really beautiful bone china designs that we find being produced at um, the Jason's factory in Blonton. I just had to show you that one. This is from um, an exhibition that we had for the centenary of Susie Cooper's birth. And you can see the black and white there. Some of these pieces are trials, like the deer at the back there and the charger. Others would have been, in general, production, like the black keystone pattern. This shows Susie Cooper in her living room producing a scraper board design. Um, she's actually producing the fruit designs for black fruit. Here you can see a negative of those designs. This is a very poor illustration of black fruit, which had actually coloured interiors and um, the different fruit on the outside. In 1957, there was a fire at Sam Susie Cooper's works and it helped to make the decision to merge with RH and SL plants and eventually they became part of the Wedgwood group and RH and SL plant were very much needed for their hotel wear contribution. Susie Cooper was to bring with her very fine bone china and um, here you can see Susie Cooper with Sir Arthur Bryan and Professor Richard Guyot, another Wedgwood designer. And here you can see one of the designs, Corn Poppy, which was produced by Susie Cooper. The, the basic can shape, not the, the, the spout or the handle, but the basic body of that was used by Wedgwood. It was adopted by them and it was one of the things that they did to uh, take over when they uh, when Susie could became part of the Wedgwood group. I'm trying to have um, a, a quote about my Susie Cooper about Ben China because I think when you, you know what she was thinking about it, it makes the understanding of a pattern like this so much more relevant. She said that um, in 1952 um, in an interview with the Evening Sentinel 
I want the beauty and translucency of China to speak for itself without being overburdened by over-rich decoration. So in fact, the, the china itself is as much a part of the design as the actual motif is a part of the design. And um, really, the, the dramatic effect of the red against the white is indeed part of the importance of that design. It's probably quite well known now that when Dudy Cooper became part of the Wedgwood Group in 1966, one of the first things that Sir Arthur Bryan suggested that she did was to go to London to imbibe the swinging 60s in places like Carnaby Street. And um, this design is called Carnaby Daisy. And at this time, you get a lot of sort of mix and match. You know, it's a mixture of matte and shiny glazes and a lot of different colours that you could put together in a sort of a harlequin fashion. Here we have another harlequin design from that time and notice as well that Susie Cooper is leaving something for the younger people as well she's not designing just traditional floral designs she's producing something that you know the um, swinging 60s newlyweds if you like that were going to be buying hopefully something that they would like to have on their table that was trendy um, in those days Diablo is another one but the other thing you have to notice about these early designs, and some of them are designs that she brings over with her from her time as an independent potter, is that she's trying very hard to fit in with the um, classical reputation of Wedgwood. So we have here, for example, we have Greek Key, and that came in uh, a variety of different colours. And that's Venetia, I think. I always get these mixed up, I'm sorry. So again, it's classical has classical roots. Here we have Susie Cooper presenting a piece of Mariposa to Princess Margaret. The big argument about Susie uh, coming over to Wedgwood was the fact that she was no longer in charge of her own factory <coughs> and that she was very talented and that she was restricted by um, coming over here. Uh, she had been promised that she could be on a par with the art director at that time. Um, Robert Minkin, um, but she doesn't seem to have been comfortable working in the roundhouse. Um, and actually, I think if you see it now, you can't, can't blame her really, but um, she decided that she would go back to Tonstall where she'd started, and um, she would have a studio at the William Adams factory. Um, but it, it also meant that she was able to work on designs that were a bit more outlandish. She had more time now. Um, you know, she didn't have to produce something for the lady that could do spots and, you know, the um, lithographers and the hand paintresses and so forth. And so she began to create some really quite incredible um, pieces. And again, this is, we have got lithos and drawings as well as, and pounces, as well as the original pieces. She was very much involved with the 1970s Egyptian revival. I need Lynn here, really, to tell me who these people are. But, uh, she's the Egyptian specialist. So you can see that she's really being able to sort of uh, branch out and produce something that we might call out of the way. I mentioned to you earlier on about cover coat. This is an example of that technique, and it's a trial that we have. And um, it is actually a textured feel on bone china. Again, she must have had a tremendous time experimenting with this sort of thing that she wouldn't have been able to do if she had remained where she was. Of course, the other thing about Susie Cooper's designs is that we can come back to them again and again. And in 1986, there were um, one or two designs of Susie Cooper's, pink fern, polka dot, and yellow daisy, um, all produced in the kestrel shape as you can see here. It's funny the way things begin to um, turn about as well because the spot design here, which was originally so popular in the 1930s, this was done for William Adams in the 1980s and this was actually done for um, Tiffany's according to the back stamp on the reverse. And there are other designs as well, such as um, this one which was done for for boots, and again it's on a William Adams shape. She's still doing 
special things for uh, major retailers, but instead of it being somebody like Heels or whatever, it, it was for um, the high street shops like Boots and so forth. And again, as I say, it's on William Adams's wear. When we had our um, exhibition over in the visitor centre, the craftsmen and women who worked there were very much inspired by what they saw, and they began to produce designs after the style of Suze Cooper. And that in itself is quite a legacy, I think. The fact that they were so keen to do this, and they were willing to have a go to anything. At the same time, John French produced a limited edition number of um, plaques, which again you can see in the case outside, uh, one with the fox and the other with the deer, very much, well, very much in the style of Susie Cooper. Needless to say, she also found popularity in Japan, I mean, to be thought so highly of all over the world. Again, it's part of the Susie Cooper legacy, it's sort of spread worldwide. And finally, is the bust by the Moorland Road Pottery. I always remember talking to Susie when things were just beginning to look a bit glum in the ceramics um, market in, in this area. And she said that she believed that although at one time big was better, like Wedgwood, like Royal Dalton, that eventually the, um, the people who would win out would be the individual designers and um, so this bust that was done by Moreland Road Pottery actually bears that out, I think, um, because they are one of the small potters who are, of course, being very successful with their individual designs. Um, you know, I often think about you saying that. As soon as you was um, thought of as being one of our local heroes, and when I was um, looking for the other things that had inspired people, I thought there was nowhere better to look than the um, little booklet that was produced, the memorial service for Susie Cooper. And uh, so I'm not going to read your words at you, people that had your, um, your things um, published there. I just chose one or two um, that Sir Arthur Bryan said that Susie was a star in the ceramics industry. One of Susie's friends, Joy Cooper, who worked with her for a, a long time, she was the daughter of John Butler, who was the designer at um, A.J. Wilkinson, and she wrote, over the next 50 years, the two women remained close friends. Um, I'm sorry, this is Lynn Miller talking about the, the two of them. Even now, Joy admires the most stunning designs and her enthusiastic conversations about Susie Cooper's pottery are peppered with the words gorgeous and beautiful, and I love that. Joy paid tribute to Miss Cooper by saying of her, she influenced me in everything I did and thought, from when I first heard of her, when I saw her at the Burton School of Art, she was held up as an example of perfect design. I just worshipped her, and she was so kind to me. I consider myself very fortunate for having known her. And so they, um, they go on. And I think really just um, you know, to see those, those tributes, we can see how they were very personal to some people. But when you look at the things that we've been looking at this afternoon, you can also see that really Susie Cooper left a legacy for absolutely everybody. And I think we're very fortunate for that. The museum is particularly fortunate because we have this wonderful collection. You know, you might look at it and think, you know, that it's a bit eccentric, you know, when you see these bits of paper stuck on cups and things like that. But as I say, they're just so important to us and are very important to um, everybody who comes to study them. Um, so uh, there you are. That's the legacy of Susie Cooper.